Dear beautiful people, Today I decided to share another ancient yoga technique with you. A yoga technique that you highly likely will not find in any book. There is a reason why I call it Ramana Mahashi's secret. Because this is one of his techniques that he used to still his mind at all times. It's not transmitted. It's not written down in books. And saints and mystics, prophets, beings with a deep level of understanding that isn't mind-based, they're not very concerned with books. Books are helpful at a certain phase of your path, so to speak. Before you can walk, yes, many people would like crutches, would like something to keep them steady, would like to help something to make the walk easier or initiate the walk or stabilize the walk. And then words and scripture become very important, but it's all very mind-based because before we transcend the mind, we study the mind <laughs> to then realize the illusion that mind poses. You know, people say, let's transcend the matrix. Well, it's not untrue that we're trying to transcend this physical world, this matrix. But the part of us that is truly attached to this physical world is the mind. So when we transcend the mind, we transcend the physical world. Now, ancient yogas are not written down in many cases because there is no line of transmission. And it's not required because initiation does not need to come through someone in a body. This is hard to accept for many. Because in the confusion, there is a wish to look for safety. And there's the question of who was initiated by which guru, by which Zen master, by which Tibetan Lama, and so on. There's always this looking for verifiable proof that something comes from a trustworthy source. And yet this is still the mind looking for outside verification because the mind is afraid not to be on the path of liberation but to be misled. And many have been misled, so their concern uh, is warranted in a way. And yet I cannot help but to say that through initiation, does not have to happen to someone in a body. So if I share with you an ancient yoga that has not been handed down, then it has been handed down in a different way. <laughs> it has been remembered in a different way. Now for Ramana Mahashi, it was very important not to focus so much on the physical yogas. He kept his teaching straightforward. It's not to, to be confused with, simplic with simplicity, even though, even though simplicity might help. It is about the most direct way to realization. And the most direct way of realization is to realize the I, the I am state, which is the nothingness or the void, so the emptiness of thought, the complete eradication of mind, even though maybe just temporary, but at least a complete cessation of identity for a certain period of time, the state of samadhi that is to be attained by a great mystic. Even though the mystic doesn't survive the samadhi. <laughs> So one of the yogas that helps still the mind is the pranayama, uh, breath work, yeah, where it's a form of hyperventilation and press breathing. I've made another video about that, about how to activate and charge up the third eye. Now, when the third eye is open and we feel pressure and energy here, and it is sufficiently stimulated, we feel the third eye as if we had another limb. If we not only had two arms and two legs, but there's something else. 
<laughs> so often when you see photos of Ramana Maharshi, his left eyebrow is a little bit lifted up. There's a reason for this. And the reason for this is that he figured out at some point when he shifted his attention from his third eye a little bit to the left, that he is another energy center that connects with the left side of the brain. And when he would give it attention, his mind would become very still, quickly. And this is a meditation technique that, that he mastered. So in many photos you see him raising the eyebrow up a little bit. And he seems to stare into the void. And there's a depth within the eyes, like an infinite depth that goes past the body. So in that sense, as a deep meditation exercise, for any of you, if you have the patience to do that, realize, please, that if I give you any technique, this is something to be practiced for months on end, even years. Having patience right now is challenging. But what better time to practice patience than when the world is in turmoil? There will be no greater opportunity to practice to become still than when the storm is around you. So the exercise is quite simple, actually. You first focus on the third eye and you find the pressure or maybe you feel a slight energy field here, you will feel some neurological stimulation in the spot. Now, when you found it, just a centimeter or 1.5 centimeter to the left, so basically, first you give your attention to the third eye, and then you shift it horizontally to the left until you feel a minor energy center that connects with the left brain hemisphere. So here, yeah? When you find that spot, just right next to the third eye, and give it all your attention, you can be surprised how quickly your mind becomes still. Another way to amplify this, this is something that I experienced in Nepal in the temple when I was meditating in front of a Kali statue in Gorkha. Um, she would show me to put attention into that spot. And a way of doing this is not only, let's say, finding your third eye and shifting your awareness to the left until you find this minor energy center. You can also direct your eyes into that spot so you look up and left, like this. Which also stimulates it. Now, I have a deep compassion for the suffering that many of you are going through. And yet, I cannot get around telling you that discipline is required more than ever. Many beings right now struggle with discipline because their attention is on the world. They are really focused on what they cannot predict, what is beyond control. Isn't it even more important than to learn how to master the mind? Often there's talk about effortlessness, but effortlessness is something that was once attained through effort. Why does someone, when they get reborn, at some point just wake up and enter Samadhi because they have done it many times before? These are not coincidences. To them, it's effortless because they have reached a state, a stage of effortlessness through effort. So that is the paradox. But is it truly then a paradox? Let's investigate that a little bit. The reason why in meditation practice, it is often said not to concentrate is because when people put in effort, they use their mind because they've been trained in school to use their mind. They've been trained in academia to use their mind. They have been trained on their jobs to use their mind. But 
the meditation is supposed to lead you beyond mind, into no mind, into the samadhi state, into the I am state. So when you tell people to meditate, they simply, because they don't know how else to do, they use their mind to try to bring something about. So they will concentrate in meditation by using the mind. which creates more disturbance in the mind. Because again, the mind is not the appropriate tool to reach such a stage of being, of presence, of stillness. So the effort that we're speaking about is simply the effort to sit, the effort to begin to the sitting. From the moment you sit, you stop concentrating at first. <laughs> so your mind opens up. And you realize no mind. When, when no mind is realized, concentration becomes a very powerful tool. <laughs> so then please understand that there are different types of meditation. Some meditation, or let's say many meditations in, in actuality, are concentration exercises. It's a focusing of awareness or energy in a very particular spot or place or dimension of being. But these type of yogas lead to tremendous confusion for many people when they have not attained no mind because they get themselves very busy and very worried and very active and very obsessed. Hmm? Dharma ridden is what the Zen monk call that. <laughs> so when you move your attention here, <laughs> it's a concentration. That's a concentration exercise, yes. At some point, it's not a concentration. At some point, you just are in such a state. So we concentrate sometimes until concentration is not necessary anymore. Because what used to take effort at some point happens automatically for us. It's not an exercise anymore. That state of exercise lessness, so to speak, when, when a great yogi reaches the state of samadhi and remains in the state of samadhi, he simply does not practice anymore because in many lifetimes he has already practiced. So he sits, he's still, and it seems effortless. Hmm. When we see that sometimes, well, many humans see that, they, they ask themselves, like, why can't I do it? Because it takes lifetimes of practice. To speak of lifetimes of practice, <laughs> when right now there's like a lifetime of maybe turmoil that you are experiencing that sounds so intensely challenging hmm? the world is on fire and you want me to sit <laughs> in stillness and silence <laughs> are you crazy <laughs> far from it I sit in silence because craziness can't survive there The one who is afraid of the world can't survive there either. A yogi is someone who kills himself. A yogi brings about death before the body dies. This is what truly liberates. The death of identity. After the death of identity, we, we can be of service in many ways. We can channel wisdom, teach certain yogas for healing, for releasing suffering, for transmuting old energies, yes. But before we can be of service, we need to die first. This is a death practice. If that doesn't scare you, this video is for you. Contemplate about that. Be well.